And so please give a big warm open group welcome to Matthew Hurd. Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as I just said, my name is Matthew Hurd. Going to a little introduction to myself. Back into the uh, why and architecture framework, just want to really drum that beat about the complexity of the product and the, the function that I work in. Bit of a recap on the TOGAF translation, you know, how we actually translated it, and then go through the stages that we currently work through, and then a few of the next steps, and talk around the, the mechanisms and the methodology of what we actually did at the various stages, and understanding the breadth and depth of the workload that was involved. So there's me. Um, I've worked in the submarine sector for just under two and a half years now. So I started as a graduate, as Steve mentioned earlier on, attracted to the submarines industry from the complexity of the project and the challenges there. So this video should play in a second. It shows how complex our product is. So as you can see, highly complex product, you know, the design's important right down to the last bolt. You know, the amount of information inside it, the amount of components that build up one of these products, you know, you see some of the photos and the size of it. Until you've been inside, I think, one of the vessels and really, you know, taken thought of how much is involved in it, you can understand the complexity. So the operations function, which is where I started my career and where I currently work and where John's worked for the last 27 years. So there's uh, 10 different departments within that, ranging from the manufacturing of parts through to the construction, the test and commissioning, and so on and so forth. There's also over 20 different disciplines from welders to pipe fitters to sheet metal workers and everything in between. So you can understand that we've got 10 different departments based on a very large site, working on a very complex product with varying differences in, in the disciplines that are on board. You know, there's a lot of interdependencies, a lot of areas for things to connect, and also a lot of areas for things to not necessarily work well. So that just gives that context again of why we needed a structured approach and why an architecture framework. So as you can see on the left hand side, that's the original model and on the right is our translated version and some of the words make sense, um, you know, things like determine the uh, enterprise capability architecture. To us didn't mean anything, but actually if we translated it into our own words, so architecture vision, and for us that was just our functional vision and strategy, what we wanted it to be. So what I'm now going to take you through for probably the next 15 minutes is a step-by-step -step approach of each of the stages and kind of what our objectives were and what we did at each phase. And I think we've had an IT function again, meltdown. This is why we use post-its and pens and paper. <laughs> Rachel, can you Click for us. You'll work it. Oh, cheers. There we go. So the first step, why change? So for ourselves, as we've talked about, we're transitioning from one product to another, greater man hour content required in order to complete that vessel. And as we've discussed, we've got a growing workforce. And to put it in one sentence, we're doubling the size of our throughput within our production facility. We simply can't double the size of the workforce. It doesn't exist. It, you know, we've had declines in the population over and the skill set, and it just doesn't exist today. So it's a very simple one-line sentence and very fundamental to what we've done. But really, I suppose the, the objective of this stage was to document and define why we're going to carry on going forward with the transformation program. And really, the thing that was involved is this was not an overnight. It was not a, oh, well, what's the problem? We'll write it on a page. Jobs are good. And we spent... I think roughly five full days, about eight hours a piece over a three month period with the functional director, all of their heads of, the wider transformation team, myself, John, 
Rachel were all involved in, in developing this and getting that key buy-in and engagement at the very onset. Because I think without that engagement, and you'll see that as a reoccurring theme as I go through this presentation, if you don't get the engagement early on, it's an uphill battle from then on. So that was really what was involved. There was a lot of time and effort in, to get that one key single sentence that kind of sums up why we're going to change. So our vision and strategy was around becoming fit for the future. You know, we've got future products, we've got future commitments that we're hopefully we're working on, and therefore we needed to become fit for the future. Now, in order to define this vision and strategy from the outset, as John talked earlier, you know, roughly 3,000 people have been involved in this process, and throughout 2013 and 14, we undertook engagement sessions with everybody within the ops function, from the welder through to the team leader, through to the foreman and the manager, to understand what are their problems, what would make their life easier, what would make their day-to-day -day job an easier thing to do, and built all those problem statements. I think we had 8,000 comments, which rolled up into around 800 kind of problem statements, alongside some of the business issues around increasing our throughput, doubling the workforce, is the capability there, how do we transition from old IT systems to new ones, there's, there's lots of kind of inputs into that and understand that. And it, it was very simple for ourselves is that to be able to address one of these problem statements, we have to have the ability to be able to do something. You know, if, if today I don't have hot water and I need hot water, then the ability I need is to boil water. That means that I now need to define something that's going to give me that ability and that was the context in which we put around that. So I say the objective for ourselves was to define that strategy and vision but also get that buy-in from all levels and understand how it all fits together. I believe the IT is working again. We'll see if I break it again. Cheers. So now we know why we need to change and we've got buy-in. That's a great start. And we've got a vision and strategy of what we want it to look like and how it's all going to fit together moving forward. The key question, I go back to my boiling water, is, OK, I need the ability to boil water, but what is my capability? Is that a kettle? Is it a pan? You know, there's many different options, but understanding what those capabilities are in order to deliver that. And something that we've used throughout is these reference points, those things like previous objectives that we may have not delivered on, previous change frameworks, previous improvement initiatives that have been done potentially in isolation and are not alongside the other capabilities, and really to define what it is we need to do in order to deliver that vision and strategy. And as you can see, we've uh, finished with 27. I believe at the height it was 35, and at its low point was 21, as we kind of defined what the scope was and understood where the capabilities would fit in. So we've now got ourselves 27 capabilities, or projects as they will then become to deliver that capability, we now need to understand how these all fit together and how we deliver them, because otherwise we're just in a danger of trying to do everything today, which basically means we don't nothing in the future. So stage C for ourselves is what we know, we deem work breakdown structure, and that's our terminology so that we could communicate that between ourselves as a team and also get that buy-in from people at various levels. So as you can see across the top, there all of our ability is the ability to boil water in my previous example along the top and all the capabilities down the left hand side. And what we started to understand is, we've, okay, we've got 28 abilities we need and 27 capabilities. So we've got 756 different connections points that can fit into that and start to develop and understand where they all fit together, how they link and how they will work together to deliver something. And I think for myself, one of the key things that jumps out to me is that no single capability is the answer. You cannot deliver one project, one capability to fix a problem. There's a lot of interdependencies from different projects that need to deliver things. So that was, you know, it was really key for ourselves to start building up that scope of work and understanding how broad and how deep it was. But as John touched on earlier, this was one of the areas where we tried to get everybody through and understand what we'd done. And actually, that wasn't needed because all we then did is confuse them and take them through 756 different review processes that we'd been through and kind of shocked people. And so actually, lesson learned for ourselves is that we maybe keep the team smaller in that aspect of stuff. The buy-in to what we've got to do and how we're going to do it is important. But understanding all those interdependencies, I think the smaller the team, the easier that would have been for us to do. So 
we've now got ourselves why we're changing, that's key. We know what we want it to look like in the future. We know the projects and the capabilities that we need to deliver and we've started to understand the interdependencies and how they all kind of fit together and work. This stage was really around understanding what do we need to do? You know, we've got a baseline of our performance today against varying capabilities and we've got that desired future state that we need to be at in the future. Now, before we went into the review sessions, again, part of this was around getting that buy-in from all the heads of, because they're the people who've got to change. They're the people who are going to have to drive these change programs through their departments. It's not myself. It's not John. We're just facilitating that change for them. So it's key to get that buy-in. So we sat down, got each of the uh, department heads of and their first line and, and sat in a room and kind of said, well, truthfully and honestly, against each of these capabilities that we've defined a base level for, you know, put some context and some words around it, and again, for an optimum level, where are you today on that scale? And it was important that honesty came out because if we got this bit wrong, then the scope of work and the depth of which that project has to go to would have been off. But actually, as John talked about earlier, that commitment from that wider team to really buy into what we're doing and, and get on with it was vital. So as I say, with 10 gap analysis sessions, I think they were three to four hours each, you know, all that data there, understanding where are we today and where are we in the future. And I think Oliver Wignall who said to me at the time, we cannot be optimum in every aspect of this. We cannot try to be an optimum in every capability. I'll get the, uh, the athlete wrong, Daley Thompson, there you go, I got it right, before my time, a decathlon athlete. You do not need to win every event in a decathlon to win gold in that event. You've got to have certain things that you're gold standard at and certain things that you've just got to finish. Everything needs to finish, but actually it's understanding what that is because otherwise, again, we're in danger of just doing too much change at once and therefore actually not working. So that, was, that thought process was involved in this stage and understanding where are we today and where do we need to be in the future. So stage E, I think mine and John's home for probably six months. We spent a lot of time in this stage and, and we tried to break it down into various phases to make it more manageable. And I think the key objective for ourselves was to define the scope of the, of the projects, but also to gain that buy-in and understand what the priorities were. So having scoped 27 projects, you know, things like who's the project owner, what's the, the, the budget, the resource required, you know, what are the key milestones and objectives? Because as John talked earlier, this had to be passed over to a program management organisation and that information was key for them to be able to manage this going forward. So we spent a lot of time in the development stage of the scope. We then needed to get the buy-in to what we'd define that scope of work to be. So as you can see, each one of the 27 capabilities was reviewed in 10 different sessions. Again, breaking it down through the operations function, through the departments and their heads of and some of the wider teams in those areas to kind of take them through what I've almost taken you through, but in obviously a lot slower time and take them through that journey. But then to also say, right, well, what are your key problems? What are the things that you need to be gold? Because as I say, myself and John could have sat in a room and we could have done this in an hour. Right, there's your five gold, there's your bronze, and there's the, the bottom and we're just going to finish on those. Done, move on. But we wouldn't have had the buy-in and we'd have been wrong. Because it's, again, it's not about ourselves, it's about engaging with those people. So that was key and fundamental. As I said, I think we spent four to five hours in each of those review sessions and they were, they were really, to be honest, I really enjoyed them at first. Before we did the sessions, I was kind of a bit nervous, thinking that this is just going to be an opportunity for some people to moan and say everything's wrong and we've not done it right or this doesn't work. But actually, it was a great opportunity to see people's passion and enthusiasm to get this right and do it properly. And that's now, the outputs from that have helped us to prioritise some of the work and understand some of those areas where we really need to, you know, commit and put up to a gold standard. So say so, those sessions, we then rolled those up into the operations kind of big six as we've got there, so those across the top, and then the orange ones underneath were kind of the functional capabilities, things that we had to do across the function anyway, but actually, you know, we're, we're, we're close and up behind, close to the, the gold standard or green as we've, we've got them in this. So as I say, really important phase and spent a lot of time and, and commitment during that. So I've kind of rattled through what we did in each stage, very high level, and you know, it's very difficult, as John said, to present all that information and data that's been involved in this. But roughly 2,500 people have had an input to this from the early engagement sessions of 2013, 14, 
through to the transformation team, the functional director, and even other directors and other functions trying to understand what we've done and where they fit within this transformation piece of work. Roughly 65 workshops and review sessions between two to eight hours apiece. So again, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy. And roughly about 8,000 man hours. You know, I had myself and John working on this probably full time for over a year, plus all of the other people involved at those various stages. And to be honest, I probably underestimated that. You know, probably more like 12, I would have thought. But a lot of time and effort that's been involved in it. It's not just five PowerPoint slides that I've taken you through today. And as you can see, you know, some of the people are actually involved in those stages. So you've got the engagement sessions here with the shop floor staff actually talking about, you know, what would make their life easier. This tooling would be better for fitting pipes. That would make welding easier. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have mobile IT access so that we can find things on an iPad rather than having to go through loads of paper? Whatever the kind of problem statement was. And in the top right-hand corner, you've got Keith Minikin, who's one of our heads of in the function, you know, standing up and taking accountability for this transformation project and what his vision is for his department within that organisation. So the next steps, we're currently, we've worked up those uh, scope sheets and the prioritisation and we've passed that over to the project management office and John touched on that earlier. We got the, the involvement from the project management office maybe slightly too late and therefore myself and John have been spending time with them getting them up to speed. What do we mean by the scope? You know, We've designed a transformation strategy, but actually it's passing that information on and I don't believe that we'll ever fully let go of that because we've, you know, we've designed it and we can help and support them and give them the direction. So we're now consolidating some of these projects. So actually the last conversation I had on Friday morning was that we've now consolidated these down into 19 projects. We've not lost the scope of work and that's important. But because we've got project leads working on multiple projects, actually, it's easier to manage if we reduce that and condense it. And the project plans are now under development, ready for ourselves to start implementing those in the near future. The implementation governance is also under development. It's really important, you know, when are we going to review each of these projects? When, how are we going to measure the success? How do we ensure that we're delivering it at the right time? along with those interdependencies so that we don't deliver something too early or too late and therefore have a knock-on impact to the rest of the programme. And I think for me, this is you know, one of the really key important things that we've got to develop and get right, is that change management piece. Yes, we've defined the scope for 27 projects. Yes, we've gained buy-in from a wide range of stakeholders. But fundamentally, somewhere along the lines, something's going to clash. And it's how we make that decision and how we understand and change that scope to ensure that we don't lose that vision and strategy and that why change along the way. And I think if we hadn't been through this process and we jumped straight to the answer, when that happened and we changed the scope, we wouldn't know what we were referring back to in the first place. And that's why change is so important. So a few final thoughts from me, really. And you know, these are my thoughts rather than the, the wider team. But you know, an architectural framework has provided structure it's standardised the approach to fixing our pro functional problems. It's given us that opportunity to really standardise that. And I know I use it on a regular basis. You know, if someone asks me to do a project or a piece of work, the first thing I'm asking myself is, why am I doing this? Why are we doing that? So that we can document and sort it out. Uh, you know, and I believe that ultimately this tool can be used for any organisation to structure any, any kind of transformational project that they need to do. And, it's the interpretation and the digestion of it that's been key. It's not about being rigid and saying, oh, sex stage A says at point three, point one says I've got to do that exact thing. It's understanding what our interpretation was and that was key for us. And as I've mentioned, you know, that process and that approach to projects is now kind of ingrained in my head. I've been doing it for 13 months now. It's my interpretation, but actually it's, it's really key and it's helped, helped me and helped my career understand how I'm going to do projects and how I'm going to do stuff moving forward. And I don't think it'll be something that I'll ever stop doing, if that makes sense. So I hope that was useful and that just kind of summarises and contextualises what we actually did in each stage. And hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions you've got later on. Thank you.